Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. Continuing our discussion with Satcholi and Roger Waters about the new film, The Occupation of the American Mind, Israel's Public Relations War in the United States. As I mentioned in the first uh, section, Satcholi is executive producer of this film and has produced many such documentaries. And Roger Waters is one of the, is the co-founder or founder of Pink Floyd and one of their lead vocalists and principal songwriter and has become a real activist advocating for Palestinian human rights. Um, so in the, I'm going to show another clip from the film and then we're going to talk about just how this narrative of Israel of, of the victim and all Palestinian resistance is terrorism, how that becomes the predominant narrative. So we're, we're going to roll that clip now. Israel can saturate the media with its spokespeople, but there's still the problem of massive Palestinian casualties showing up on television screens. You can't make those images go away. An Israeli official actually said, in the war of pictures, we lose. So you need to correct, explain, or balance it in other ways. Here again, the Luntz document spells out which talking points have been most effective in spinning the brutal reality of Palestinian casualties. He says the first thing the pro-Israeli spokespeople should do is to express empathy for the innocent victims. Unfortunately, innocents do get hurt, and we, we really grieve that. We're sad for every civilian casualty. The entire situation is, is tragic. Once you've done that, Lund says, you also have to get people to empathize with Israelis by describing what life is like for them, living in constant fear of Hamas rocket attacks. So again and again, we hear the focused, tested phrase that the rockets are raining down on Israel. We have thousands of rockets raining down on our civilians. Rockets were raining down on Israel. Any advertising executive will tell you the essence of propaganda is repetition. Rockets raining down on southern Israel. Rockets raining down on Israel. Well, Hamas rockets rain down on Israeli border towns. Then Luntz tells PR spokespeople to turn the tables and ask the American people, what would you do? So what would you do in the United States? Can you imagine um, what America would do if it were facing a similar threat? We always try to ask you the question we ask ourselves. What will you do? What would you do? What would you do if more than 3,000 rockets had been fired on your cities? What would you do? 3,000 rockets. What would you do if terrorists were tunneling under your frontier? What would you do if three kids are kidnapped because of a tunnel network? What sort of question is this? Of course, anybody would act to defend themselves against unprovoked aggression, but it is a question that is completely devoid of any context. What drives the society to a point where after multiple devastating wars, they continue to resist with these most feeble methods? They don't want you to ask that question. They don't want you to ask what is behind this? What's the history here? Who are these people? Where did they come from? Why are they so desperate? No, they want you to understand Israeli behavior. Israeli behavior is always characterized as a reaction to unprovoked violence. So, uh, so uh, the point you're making here uh, is that this is no accident. This is a very calculated PR plan, the way you Procter & Gamble rolls out a new toothpaste, uh, which I guess with even some of the same kind of methodology and technology. Um, talk about how this developed. Um, well, the, the start of the modern campaign, uh, we can trace back to 1982. Uh, and in fact, American audiences would be stunned uh, at the kind of coverage that the uh, American networks gave to the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. It was incredibly critical and showed the horror of, uh, of, of, of both the invasion and then the, the slaughter at the, at the camps of Shabra and Shatila. Uh, and Is Israel was horrified. Uh, at the kind of, you know, the, uh, at real journalism taking place. And they essentially said, we can't let this happen again. And so they set about uh, with, with a very uh, calculated, coordinated campaign, which they called the Hasbara Project, uh, that was going to be designed to control the discourse uh, in the United States. And there was a conference that took place in 1984 in which they called together, uh, gathered together many, many people, uh, experts in uh, public relations, in advertising, in communications, uh, to come up with this strategy. Okay, uh, let's roll a clip from the film, which is about exactly this conference. Two years after the Lebanon invasion, the American Jewish Congress sponsored a conference in Jerusalem to devise a formal public relations strategy 
known in Hebrew as Hasbara. Participants included PR and advertising executives, media specialists, journalists, and leaders of major Jewish groups. According to a brochure from the Congress, no single event brought home the need for a more effective Hasbara or information program more persuasively than the 1982 war in Lebanon and the events that followed. As one conference participant put it, Israel is no longer perceived to be Little David, but Goliath steamrolling across the map. The primary aim of the conference was to develop strategies to spin unpopular Israeli policies and to counter negative press coverage by shaping the media frame in advance. News doesn't just jump into a camera, the conference delegate said. It's directed, it's managed, it's made accessible. Israel-based advertising executive Martin Fenton would put it in even more blunt terms. Propaganda is not a dirty word, he said. Face it, we are in the game of changing people's minds and making them think differently. To accomplish that, we need propaganda. The conference was chaired by U.S. advertising executive Carl Spielvogel, the legendary ad man who created the highly acclaimed Miller Lite beer ads in the 1970s. The choice of Spielvogel makes perfect sense. He's known as a master of image inversion and rebranding. The ad man responsible for transforming Miller Lite, which had been viewed before as a woman's beer, into a manly beer that tough guys would drink. But the best part is that it tastes so great. <laughs> the best part is it's less filling. Nah, it tastes great. Less. Philly. His job with Israel would require the same kind of rebranding, only in the opposite direction, to help soften the image of a country that's coming to be seen as a bully. So he recommends creating a cabinet post dedicated exclusively to explaining policy, whose job would not be setting policy, but presenting it in the most attractive way to the rest of the world. Classic PR is to say the problem is not the policy, it's the presentation. When the policies are so reprehensible that many people become critical, rather than acknowledge there's anything wrong with the policy, there's a doubling down on the PR effort. So Roger, talk about a bit about the clip we just saw and, and how, how and why you think this campaign has been so successful. Well, that's a very interesting point, why it's been so successful, because it's so transparent. And, it, and, and any rational man would think, this cannot possibly work. But unfortunately, there's a lot of precedent for this, this particular technique. You know, if you tell the big lie often enough and loud enough, people will believe it. And, it, and, and you know, as is explained in this thing, in, in that clip, um, this has been used um, to sell soap powder or shampoo or motor cars often, uh, often in the past, and it's used now to sell policy. And um, so it's exactly right that everything changed in 82 after the uh, invasion of Lebanon. So um, I think it's about getting spokespeople as well, particularly politicians, to repeat the mantra. And this is one of the problems with the fact that um, Congress is for sale in this country, particularly after Citizens United, um, that the disastrous ratification of that bill by your Supreme Court. Um, and so, which means uh, effectively that uh, members of Congress, um, both the Senate and the House, are for sale. You can buy them. And we all know that and everybody knows it. But it's kind of something that people prefer not to talk about, because if you had owned up to it, you would need to start looking at the whole way that your society works and the politics of the United States in a, in a grown-up and rational way, which would be very, very difficult, based as the whole thing is on commerce. I know I'm rambling, but, you know, this is it's a complex issue. So if we get back to Hasbara, they have discovered that they can do it. They can operate policies that are murderous and genocidal and operate apartheid, uh, which is a dirty word um, it, here particularly, but all over the world it's a dirty word and recognize that apartheid is, is um, unforgivable and indefensible. And yet the Israelis operated in the uh, territory that they occupied in 1967. And nobody says boo here 
And, the, and you are asking the question, well, why does nobody say boo? Why, why is there no response to any of this? And I, I think Soot can answer that question much better than I can, because I confess I'm flabbergasted and flummoxed whenever I come up against this question, because their answers are so clearly a tissue of untruth that, that for us, we the people, that we the people cannot see through it, and that still large numbers of us support Israeli policy, um, is very hard to penetrate. Ask Sue, he'll tell you. All right. Tell. Well, he's here, I'll ask him. Yeah. And, and not only do you find this you know, support for Israel, even in the midst of uh, an attack on Gaza, and I should point out that even a Bernie Sanders, who took, you know, recently, a much more balanced and, and complex view of, of how America should approach the question. But even Sanders voted for the resolution saying Israel had a right to defend itself at the time they're bombing Gaza. So, you know, even in the Democratic Party, you have people with relatively progressive ideas. They oppose the war in Iraq and other things. And here I'm not isolating Sanders. There's others certainly far, far more in this way. But they see Israel as this sort of outpost of civilization or something and surrounded by, you know, the forces of anarchy and chaos. And they kind of really internalize that. The right to defend itself is part of the Frank Lutz mantra because it covers a multitude of sins with one simple phrase that sounds on the face of it defensible. But defending a country like Israel by um, operating a collective, murderous, genocidal policy upon a neighboring people who are entirely under your control um, is not defense. It is aggressive beyond all imagination. All right, so, so this is the slaughter of people locked up in a concrete pen and kept there with guns, tanks, planes, ships, navies, machine guns. They are contained in a prison. It's exactly as if they were all in prison. And then it, you, if if some of them resist, if some of them say, and I'm not defending the use of Qasim rockets to fire into farmland in Israel, which is where they go. They do not rain down on cities. There has never been any raining down of rockets. And certainly they have caused almost no casualties. The fatalities caused by rockets fired from, for, by, from, by Hamas or whoever else in Gaza are tiny, certainly by comparison um, with, the, uh, with the loss of life. It, um, that Israel causes with its hugely sophisticated weaponry when they attack this imprisoned population. So it's not defense. It has nothing to do with defense. That is the propaganda. That is the Hasbara that is repeated. And Obama said it repeatedly. Hillary Clinton says it. Every politician, even Sanders, as you say, he said it in the... He said it because it's something that you have to say. It's a Obligatory, you say, Israel has a right. Of course Israel has a right to defend itself. All states have a right to defend themselves. People who don't have a right to defend themselves is, of course, are the Palestinian people because they don't have a state. They are a stateless people. They are an inconvenience on the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. And that is what this is about. This is what Sut and I are working for. We believe that these people should have rights like everybody else does. None of us would for a second live under a situation where we had no civil rights, no rights to our own, to religion, to anything, no vote, nothing, where we were considered second class. We would resist. Now they, to their eternal credit, have resisted by and large in peaceful ways. And they've done it as much as they can, but you can only push people so far and they will respond. And they have a moral and legal right to respond to military right. occupation. So uh, there's been a particular war in this PR war on American university campuses. And it's interesting that uh, as the BDS movement has grown, and but it's it certainly predates the BDS movement, it's been considered a very serious front of struggle for this PR campaign. Uh, talk a bit about it. 
I mean, the PR campaign is based around, I mean, the film is called The Occupation of the American Mind, and they've managed to occupy the American media so that this narrative is everywhere. And they've managed also to occupy the American Congress. So they've taken over the media and, and politics and the culture in general. The one place they haven't is the universities where there actually is some diversity of thinking around this. Okay, just before you go further, who's they? Uh, sorry, this is the, the, the Israeli PR campaign. Which, is, uh, which means the Israeli state. Is the Israeli state. Some is, yeah. major funders in the United States, Haim Saban, Sheldon Adelson, and some others. And, and also the American government itself. I mean, this is not Israel you know, controlling a, a government that wants to do something else. Uh, the reason it's worked so well is that the interests of the American government are very congruent with the interests of, uh, of, uh, of the Israeli state as well, which is why it's worked so well. Because this is, is the narrative of the president, the State yeah, Department. Yeah, so this is, this is not just an Israeli narrative narrative is it becomes an American narrative yeah. as well. I want to talk about the campuses. Uh, but the campuses, are the, I mean, I, I think it's very significant. It's the one place where there is any diversity of, uh, of thinking around these issues. And so now, of course, uh, the Israeli PR campaign has turned its focus there. <laughs> uh, and it's become, I mean, I think it's the, almost the last stage uh, where this battle will be fought. Uh, and, but I think it's significant. When Americans, American students actually have a choice when American students actually have some, uh, have different perspectives, it's not surprising then uh, that their opinion changes. And that is what the, the, camp the PR campaign is, is scared of. The P PR always has two aspects. One is control the narrative, and the other one is maintain a monopoly. Make sure there's no counter-narrative. And the on the universities, you're starting to have a counter-narrative and a very effective counter-narrative. And, you know, and, and billionaires like Sheldon Adelson are now starting to put lots of money uh, into making sure uh, that, those, that that alternative voice is wrapped up very quickly. Right. Uh, the way it's being done is through, I mean, they're scared stiff of BDS. Um, as a, Boycott, as, divestment, sanctions. Yeah, because it's actually, um, it, it's, an, it's an effective story that's being told. And so that what they're trying to do on American campuses is call BDS um, hate speech and trying to ban it on, uh, on that basis. Um, we're, we're in the middle of that. I mean, where we will end up uh, on it will, be, will depend upon how we struggle against it. And there's places uh, in Canada and even in Europe in certain places where this whole idea of BDS is so equated with hate speech, they're trying to make it illegal, advocating of it. Uh, Roger, uh, one of the things that it seems to me helps drive this thing, uh, this thing being that critiquing Israel is anti-Semitic, it's anti-Jewish, uh, which is at the core of, you could say, this PR campaign. And, and one of the reasons why people can see images of children dying and images of the war and somehow get their head around, oh yeah, it's collateral damage and it's really these people's fault because they hate Jews. Um, one of the reasons that works is there is there's a kernel of truth in the sense that the, while not all critique of Israel is anti-Semitic, some is. And there's certainly a deep-rooted history of hating Jews. Of course, this is more a European phenomena than an Arab phenomena. But, uh, but for a lot of people, they don't get, uh, because of the cultural history of Judenhaus, uh, that what's going on is not that. Uh, but isn't that an, an, an important piece of this? Well, I, I think it's a great tragedy for the Jewish people and for the Jewish religion that it is conflated uh, in, in people's minds with the policies of the government of Israel and its policies of colonization and its annexation of land that does not belong to it. The illegal occupation, 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 occupation. That is the most important word in all of these conversations. Um, so, but I wanted to pick up on something that Sue said, which was that the needs of the American government are in some way aligned with uh, the goals and needs of the state of Israel. I'm, I'm, I don't necessarily agree with that, sir. And I certainly don't think that the needs um, and goals of the American people are in line with the goals of the uh, state of Israel. I think they conflict hugely. Um, because um, American support for the goals of the State of Israel uh, goes um, a long way towards uh, creating not just an image, but a description of the United States of, of America as an oppressor of the people of the Middle East. Um, and, and, and in consequence, it creates a lot of enmity towards this country, the United States of America, 
in that region as a whole. Um, so so um, I, I think that, this, the, that the unthinking, um, automatic uh, support of the State of Israel in its policies vis-a-vis -vis its surroundings is actually bad for the people of the United States of America. It makes it harder for them to be um, respected, um, taken seriously, um, uh, accepted as a partner to conversations that may find more um, edifying ways of conflict resolution than dropping bombs on one another, which routinely the United States does as well, as we know, with the drone policies. So I, th so I think it's actually very, very harmful to the potential that the United States might have to regain um, some of its um, position politically. Right. And, so, and, and, and then there's the certainly recognition of that among uh, American elites. Uh, that this policy is is resulting in blowback. I mean, the answer to the question, why do they hate us? Well, one of the reasons is because of the, the this un, the unconditional support of Israel. And so even people like David Petraeus, you know, when he was in power, you know, was saying what the counter, uh, you know, what the effects of this was in terms of how America was being held. However, that's, you know, on the one hand you have that, but until that outweighs the strategic value that the U.S. has in supporting Israel in the Middle East. And, and you know, the, the Nixon administration called it a cop on the beat, you know, and, and to protect its strategic interests. Until that outweighs those strategic interests, uh, it's not going to make a difference. But there are, I mean, I, I mean, Roger is absolutely right. There are, I think, more and more even American elites who are starting to look at, you know, what, what are the, 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 the costs of this, type of, um, uh, of this type of support. But the moment those costs have not outweighed what, uh, what the benefits are. Well, I, th are. I think you're kind of really agreeing, because it's about whose national interest. The elite's national interest and the yeah. American yeah. people's national interest are more often than not not the same national interest. Yeah. What is super important is the issue of the campuses. There is now, because of the apartheid in the, in the occupied territories, there is now a real groundswell of a genuine protest movement taking place in the young people on the campuses. And, and a lot of these young people, one has to say, are young Jewish people who care about their heritage, they care about their religion, they care about their own ethical standards, and they can see that they are being associated with a tyrannical regime that is a right-wing tyrannical regime that is running this small state in the Middle East, and they don't like it. They do not want their name taken in vain like that. So this is so important, what is going on. It's, not, it's on the campuses of the universities in North America, both in Canada and in the United States, but it's also in the churches, which slowly but surely there is a creeping resistance to the slaughter and more and more churches are gathering together in their annual synods and divesting from companies that support the settlements and the occupation, companies like Motorola and Caterpillar and, and the rest of them, and G4, and so on and so forth. So it's, this movement is gaining momentum. There are many, many people, and this is, this is an iceberg. Just the tip of it is showing above the surface. But the reason that Sheldon Adelson and Chaim Saban are pouring money to try and uh, to try and make this protest movement illegal is because they can see how fast it's growing, and it's growing because the protesters are right. They have right on their side. The treatment of the Palestinian people is deeply unjust and 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 appalling. And the fact that we're not allowed to see Suit's film because it shows how we're not allowed to see that part of the narrative. I'm just so glad that the real news is taking the time and the trouble to expose this to people because it's fundamentally important to all of our humanity. All of our humanity, not just the students, God bless them, who are protesting on the campus. Oh, so tell us one more time. Uh, as we know, you can't see this on Netflix, at least not yet. Maybe if everybody writes Netflix and screams that we want it, that's an idea. Um, at the, for now, where do people see the film? Uh, they can see it uh, at www.occupationmovie.com. 
and you can stream it there and you can buy the DVD as well. And one of the strategies that we have, I mean, we want as many people to see it as possible. I mean, we wish we could give it away <laughs> and, and it'd be available for free. It cost a lot of money to make that film. Yeah, it cost us over half a million dollars to make this film and, you know, and, um, and trying to get it out. As, I mean, we knew it was going to be a struggle. We didn't actually realize it was going to be as much of a struggle as it has been. Uh, we thought we would be blanketed from the mainstream media just because of what the movie is well, about. you're not getting an, another way you can get to the film streaming, which is, I think, five bucks to watch the film or you can buy a DVD, is on the Real News homepage. You'll see a copy of this movie poster. If you click on it, it will take you to the page where you can get to the film. I, as people watch the Real News, they know I'm a documentary filmmaker. That's really my background. And this is a good <laughs> film. But you're not getting into film festivals. No, no, we're not getting into any American film festivals. We're getting into some foreign or film Canadian. festivals. Yeah. Now we we were we've been blanketed in every single film festival uh, that we've you know, we applied to North American film festival. Yeah, I, I just found out. I mean, I started the Hot Docs Film Festival, and I just found out I'm not involved anymore in day to day way. I just found out Hot Docs didn't accept it. Huh? Which, anyway, if you're in the Baltimore area, anywhere around, uh, sometime in the next uh, couple of months, uh, we're going to screen the film. Uh, and I, actually, I hope Roger and Sutter might even be able to come here for the screening. Um, but at any rate, we're going to continue this discussion, and please join us for the next part of our interview with Roger Waters and Sutjoli uh, on the Real News Network.